Oh, hey there. <laughs> Welcome to another SVS Audiophile Happy Hour and uh, Happy Early Thanksgiving. Or Thanksgiving, St. Patrick's Day. Jeez. <laughs> yes. I <laughs> swear it hasn't been. Obviously, you're already celebrating St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I really haven't. I'm actually, I've saved my first sip to the beginning of this, but uh, just a little loopy here, obviously. But uh, welcome anyone who uh, is joining us for the first time. This is the SVS Audiophile Happy Hour. Uh, I am joined by my colleagues at SVS, and we'll just go around and start with uh, Smith Freeman to our right. He's our chief product designer. Smith, how are you this evening? Yeah. I'm great. How are you? Excellent. Ed Mullen, John. our director of technology and customer service to the right of him. Ed, how are you? Doing awesome. Thank you. All right. Our leader and uh, chief executive officer, uh, officer that's uh, Gary Yakubian below me. How are you doing, Gary? I am tripping on my words today. <laughs> You are you. Know, th this is obviously you're celebrating St. Patrick's Day very early, and it's 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 a little yes. disturbing. For me. It is. Are you going to keep going starting there. now until tomorrow night? I, I promise to get better. This is um, you know, <laughs> you're doing great. A little bit of jinx, and uh, hey, of course, you know, I was just going to say I'm really happy to be here, and it feels like this is the first one, normal one, like you know, not from a remote location that we've done in, in oh, it feels like a long time. I could be wrong, but great to be yeah, with we the at, SBS community, watching all these great comments. We were at the Florida Audio Expo for our last one. So a change of pace here. And I our wasn't next one there. Be at Expona. So yeah, we're, we're, we've been hitting the events hard. I was uh, in Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would have been a fun one there. I'm not sure what the lag would be. Um, and then we have the Larry Magoo, our national training manager, who is under a tornado warning. So if we get like a Wizard of Oz live, then, uh, you know, that could be a first here. for the Yeah, if you're not total. Thunder and crashing and two-inch hail, then uh, I'm just adding to make this a more immersive experience. <laughs> well, this is... Garage. Yeah. No fit. Oh, boy. So this is a special episode, um, and you know we're, we're doing our official launch of our 3000 in-wall subwoofer, which uh, has been available for a couple weeks, but we haven't really talked about it here on the uh, broadcast. So we're going to get into that, but got some housekeeping and uh, some traditions to withhold. So uh, the first thing that I would like to say is uh, there's going to be Hold, four awesome giveaways withhold. tonight. Uphold, withhold. <laughs> Grammar police out in full of yeah, clearly we call someone at Nick's house and tell him to take away his green beer. <laughs> this is how much I've had. One tiny sip of Guinness, I swear. That's it. Yeah, but it's been in your basement for three years fermenting. The alcohol <laughs> content skyrocketed. I think the hat's too tight, too. It's cutting off circulation in my head. So there, there's multiple things going on here that aren't helping my cause. But uh, we have four awesome giveaways. That is helping my cause. And uh to be eligible, all you have to do is leave a comment, ask a question, which I see people flying in from Chicago here and New York and Tampa and uh, everywhere. So uh, thank you for those comments and thank you for coming and joining us th throughout the country. And Larry, you've taken copious notes on what our awesome giveaways are tonight. So why don't you uh, give a little teaser there? Yeah, huge notes uh, for these four giveaways. So the first one we've got for you is an SB1000 Pro subwoofer to kick off the giveaways, followed up by a pair of our prime wireless powered bookshelf speakers, then a 3000 micro subwoofer. And then we're gonna wrap it all up at the end of the night with a Soundbase Pro amplifier, pair of our prime bookshelf speakers and the ultra sound path cable to hook it all up. So lots of great prizes. Awesome, and I know people are still asking when you're gonna give away one of your t-shirts. So uh, maybe on the next one when we're uh, live in Chicago, I know you don't love those ideas. <laughs> I will just order some other ones to give them away, maybe. All right, all right. Um, well, as is the tradition, we do want to go around, and I'm going to share my picks first. I actually did a teaser for uh, what I thought was a very good children's movie um, that I watched recently uh, when we did our teaser, Larry and I, yesterday, and that is Detective Pikachu. I thought was a phenomenal audio experience. Uh, it's got a decent story, but there's actually going to be a sequel, but there's some really immersive sonic action going on with Detective Pikachu. So I recommend it as a family movie. Um, obviously like the rest of this world, I've been watching The Last of Us, uh, watched the, the final episode there, which I thought was just incredible. Um, and then I, got it. I haven't seen that. I've heard it's amazing. Yeah. It really is good. And then the menu. I wanted to see it for a long time. I, I finally saw the menu and it lived up to what I hoped it would be. So uh, those are my recommendations for uh, for this week. And uh, I'll go right to you, Smith, and, and you can tell us what you've been tuning into. Um, I just watched Luther, the, the, the feature length one, and the sound was awesome. The movie left me feeling in like a very gloomy place for a while. <laughs> was it so, like super disturbing, Smith? It's, I heard it. it's a little intense. It's a little yeah. intense. But the sound was, the soundtrack and everything was awesome. So that was great. Did it come through in Atmos? 
uh, uh, that it's, uh, Netflix, right? Yeah, I think it's Atmos. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, that's all I. Got. Ed, that's yours. Ed, that's your cue. You go next. Uh, we've been just starting to watch the recruit. It's a lot of fun. I'm on episode three now. I, I like that, and uh, I've been jamming to a lot of uh, Sean Mullins' uh, acoustic stuff. He's been a very influential musician and artist for me over the decades. Uh, and uh, every now and then I got into a, you know, kind of a jam with him and uh, it's, it's really great. Excellent. And uh, Gary, I know you've been on the road quite a bit. Um, you've seen some live acts, but what else uh, have you been into? So, yeah, I saw a wonderful concert. Uh, uh, oh, we lost Nick. Um, uh, <laughs> Jazz at Lincoln's, uh, Are we not uh, surprised, uh, Gary? <laughs> uh, we, were, we thought we were going to lose Larry and said we lost Nick. Um, can you guys hear I me? Saw, though? Yes. We can hear you. Ah, yeah. All right. Well, I saw Jazz at Lincoln Center at the uh, Kennedy Center in uh, DC, and I actually got to uh, meet Wynton Marsalis, which was really, really cool. Wow. And and um, but I have a couple. I'm going to complain about a couple of things. Is that okay? Um, <laughs> Always good. You're not surprised, are you? No. I I tried three times, three times to watch everything, everywhere, all at once, and I. I just don't get it. I, I couldn't process it. Uh, and I feel kind of, I did get through the whale, but I'm not going to, I'm again, that's another one where I'm just scratching my head. I have to say, I think based on the movies I've seen, Top Gun should have won. Um, top, <laughs> top, top Gun was more fun than any of them. Um, but I do have a positive one, uh, which is this, uh, The uh, you guys know we've talked about it. The Netflix um, Formula One series, which is called uh, Drive to Survive or something like that. Yeah. It's on that every, we all know it's in Dolby Atmos. It's absolutely just so much fun to watch. It's just really, really well done. Good, no, good sound. Um, so that's my positive recommendation. I'm enjoying that. I'm not all the way through it. I, know, I knew what happened last season, but still rewatching it and watching this amazing footage that they create of these races. It's, it's thrilling and definitely don't do it on your phone. Do it in a in your home theater with a big TV and, and surround sound. You'll love it. Do you watch the live races, F1? I not every single one, um, uh, but I do. I like to. I like them better when they move later in the day. Like there's one this weekend in Saudi Arabia. I'm, I'm, I'm just not in the mood to watch something at nine in the morning. A you know sporting event. Although I will. There's no SBS employees on this call. I I have to admit I had. Uh, my alma mater, University of Maryland, played today at uh, at noon Eastern time, and I did have it on the TV with the sound turned down. <laughs> I apologize. I know that was wrong. That's why that Maryland did win. I think that's Maryland's first win in uh, in uh, March Madness in in, in years. Um, so that was kind of fun to see. Well, Larry, I know you've seen one of the movies that I'm most intrigued to get a, a hot take on. Uh, what what have you been into? So I, you know, I've been traveling a lot, so I've had a chance to catch up or rewatch a few things, but also a few ones in the theater. I saw Cocaine Bear the weekend it came out. <laughs> uh, it's a great '80s fun romp. You know, it's not gonna, it will never get nominated. I don't know, it could get nominated for visual effects because that bear was all CGI, so it was uh, pretty well done. Uh, I saw Creed three the night it came out when I was in Pittsburgh, uh, coming back from our last meeting. And then uh, The Last of Us, obviously, a lot of us have been watching. I just got to say, man, Bella Ramsey, gosh, she's been good in that. Um, Mandalorian is back, so I'm caught up on that. And Ted Lasso came back last night. And that may be my favorite show on TV, so I was really excited for that. A lot of people like that show. I, I did watch it is the really first good. two seasons. I, Jason Sudeikis is absolutely amazing in that. Well, I thought the Mandalorian had some phenomenal. That uh, opening episode had some great sound effects and uh, some action there. So, you know, even if uh, there's been a little criticism about the story, which I like, uh, I thought it's been a great immersive experience. So, um, definitely would recommend that. Uh, I did, Gary, want to put you on the spot. I know you like to share perspective sometimes on, on artists when they pass. And I know there's a jazz legend um, who we talked about on our team meeting a couple of weeks ago by the name of Wayne Shorter, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Um, but I'd love to just get your take on sort of the le legacy that he left and, you know, some of your thoughts there. I mean, thank you, because I actually had said to myself, I wanted, you know, we talked about music that we're listening to. Um, and I did go back and listen to uh, a bunch of Wayne Shorter um, 
after he died, which it's a shame to, to miss, you know, to, to sort of forget about somebody when they're still alive and then realize you did that. Um, I'm going to say from my case, the greatest saxophone player who ever lived just as a saxophone player is Wayne Shorter. I loved him, but he was also very underrated as a, as a, I, I don't know if you, what you call a jazz songwriter. They're not really songs, but they're jazz pieces. Composer. And um, he was just a, a phenomenal writer. He wrote a lot of the greatest music of what I call the um, the greatest jazz uh, ensemble of all time, which is the second Miles Davis quintet, the quintet that played in the 60s. So for you guys who um, are not familiar and you want an entry point to Wayne Shorter, but also just, I think, the greatest jazz band that ever existed, go to that second quintet. Sorcerer is one of the, the top albums. Nefertiti is another one. And um, uh, 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 Miles, uh, Miles Smile is another one. Um, we're, a lot of them were, a lot of the best songs were written by Wayne Shorter. And he actually was creative all the way up almost until he, he died. He died at 91 and in his 80s. He did something with our friend Danilo Perez, which was really well received. So very much a giant in jazz. He lived a long, good, long life. It's hard to call it a tragedy when somebody's 91 when they die. Um, but uh, absolutely, go back and listen to some Wayne Shorter. He also was in Weather Report, I see in the comments, which was probably the first really good jazz rock fusion uh, band. And he wrote a lot of their best music as well. Wayne Shorter also was guest saxophonist on Steely Dan's uh, famous track, Asia. I don't know if anybody knows that, but the sax on that track is just, it, it just gives you goosebumps. Uh, and, and that was him really. Yeah. Uh, well, he's, uh, if you can go, you can Google it and see, he's been a part of some really amazing music. Uh, we've just, I just scratched the surface a little bit, just mentioning a few things, but you can find a lot of other things he's done. Just amazing uh, creative force of nature, really. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, I just thought the conversation we had earlier on our team meeting, it just, it opened my eyes to him and I listened and, you know, I, I couldn't agree more about, um, you know, everything you're saying. And uh, I did want to share a Very couple of sensible, like a normal person can yeah. not really familiar with jazz can listen to it and, 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 and have an entry point to jazz. And yet it's amazing. Um, music for people who, you know, uh, feel they know dad. So it's, it really hits every, uh, checks every box, I think. So it's been a busy uh, couple weeks of uh, booking events for SVS too. So before we get into some chat about our 3000 in wall subwoofer, I did want to share a couple of the upcoming events. That also we also got your do. giveaway. Oh, we have a giveaway. Are we there yet? Oh, we're right about there. So uh, let's do the, the event announcements and then we'll be ready for our first giveaway. Uh, but uh, coming up in April 14th through the 16th, we'll be at Axpona in Chicago, actually Shamsburg, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And uh, I mean, that is the biggest audio show in the uh, North America, most widely attended, most brands exhibiting. So great opportunity to uh, see a lot of and hear a lot of different demos. Uh, and we will be there with two rooms. So Definitely want to check us out there. Munich High End, anyone who is headed out to Germany for that is the largest audio show in the world. Uh, that will be May 18th through the 21st. Uh, get all the information online if you want to make that trip, but it's truly a spectacle. I mean, they got a whole car section where they got like Bugattis and Lamborghinis and just the highest of the highest end uh, gear that you can possibly imagine. And it's just a, you know, it's, it's an absolutely blast for uh, people who have never been to Munich. Um, and then one more we just put on the calendar is the Home Entertainment Show. We are coming back to the West Coast. Uh, this year it'll be in Costa Mesa, California. Uh, that is June 9th through the 11th. So get your tickets early, make your plans. But we're going to have an uh, awesome demo set up there as well and some fun activities planned for California out in June. So uh, yeah, that is our comments upcoming asking. I would love to see SoCal. some of the... I'm sorry, Larry. What were you saying? I was gonna say, there's been quite a few people saying, hey, when are you coming back to SoCal? So that's exciting. June yeah, 9th no, I saw that. And in fact, we had somebody saying hello from Costa Mesa, which was cool. Um, and and uh, or they're going to come see us in Costa Mesa, I think they said. And, and you know, and I, I was going to say, you know, Expona is great because there's no easier city to get in and out of than than Chicago. And they don't do it in Chicago um, proper. They do it in Schaumburg, which is, um, you know, lodging and things like that are not very expensive. 
Um, and then the, this uh, uh, Orange County one in, in Costa Mesa, um, as Smith was saying, it's it's that's another one that's very easy to get to. So, I mean, we would I'd love to. This is what we live for is is um, interacting with all of you who are on th this. Uh, what is this? A Zoom? You, is this officially not a Zoom? Probably not allowed to say that. Um, love to see you guys in person if at all possible and hearing a live demo nothing replaces it nothing and we love to get we get our game face on for these events and, and usually uh we'll we'll impress a lot of people absolutely and with that we have our first giveaway of the evening and uh, just to say we're going to be doing happy hours from all three of those events so uh well maybe not munich we'll have to figure the timing out on that one but uh we'll be doing some live broadcasting at, at least uh if not for a happy hour just for uh, for our social media uh but first giveaway of the evening as larry mentioned is an sb1000 pro subwoofer and our winner for that is one mr ron silberman Congratulations, Ron Congrats. Silberman. Hey, uh, Ron. Get your subwoofer out there. You're going to have a rocking St. Patty's Day. Um, so we uh, we are not officially announcing the 3000 in wall tonight because it's been available for a couple weeks. But uh, we have Smith here. We have Ed uh, and, of course, Gary. So uh, we, we want to go through just some of uh, what makes this product special, why we actually developed it. And if uh, you'll bear with me here, I'll pop a picture up here on screen so we can see it. And Larry... Uh, Sorry, Gary, why don't you give a quick frame up of just what went into this product, why we decided to come out with our first architectural audio product? Well, it's fun for me to tweak Smith because the plan was uh, for uh, 3000 micro and um, 3000 in wall to come out at the same time. And 3000 micro came out when Smith, I'm trying to remember. Uh, earlier. <laughs> years ago. Came out two years ago. But l listen, let, let me talk a little bit about that because people were um, asking me for years, how come you don't do a micro subwoofer? Um, and um, how come you don't do an in-wall subwoofer? I, I'm not going to name brands, but there are several brands where really the only thing they, they, they're very successful at is a micro subwoofer. That's, that's one brand. I'm not naming it. And um, another brand um, where uh, really the only thing they were very successful at as they were in decline was their in-wall subwoofer. And um, again, I'm not naming names, <laughs> but why didn't we do that? It was an obvious way for us to, you know, sort of um, make sales. And the reason was that we didn't feel those were real subwoofers. Um, we didn't think they delivered a, a, an experience that I would want to put, or any of us would want to put the SVS brand on. And then Smith worked with technology that was not available until very recently and did some work on driver uh, uh row distance and things that are very esoteric and created 3000 micro and blew everyone's doors off with uh, what was possible in a micro subwoofer. Um, but 3000 in wall was another, just a different engineering problem. We couldn't solve the things we wanted to do um, with 3000 in wall using the things we learned creating 3000 micro. That was a little bit of a wake up call, right Smith? But you know what? Smith, Smith and the team were relentless. And um, 3000 in-wall is a subwoofer that um, is a real subwoofer. It's not a fake subwoofer, which I would have said that about pretty much every other micro subwoofer. And I definitely would have said that about pretty much every other in-wall subwoofer. This is a real subwoofer and it's a subwoofer worthy of our brand. So yeah, two years late, maybe not. Maybe it was right on time, <laughs> right on time because it, it, it delivers a true subwoofer experience. Also, um, because it's an in-wall subwoofer, it's the first SVS product you can't buy direct from SVS. That's a little weird, but we wanted to make sure people had a great experience and, and uh, didn't want to leave the variables of installing it just out there for you know people to uh, disappoint themselves. So um, uh, at the, at the suggested retail, you don't, you're not going to be charged more. Um, you, uh, I suppose they'll charge for the installation itself, but at the suggested retail, you can, you can have a dealer, uh, install it for you. So I think you alluded to, uh, the engineering aspects and, and Smith, one of the reasons I thought it would be great to have you on was, you know, there's challenges involved with, 
uh, manufacturing and designing an in-wall subwoofer that don't exist with the traditional floor standing cabinet model. Um, maybe get into a little bit of what those challenges are and then uh, we can talk about how, how they were overcome. Yeah, well, I, I mean, just anecdotally, anecdotally, um, when, oh, when we first- been at the green beer too, and it's only three in the afternoon. <laughs> it's where not Smith green is, beer, so. it's scotch. Come on, guys. No, um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, but, but really, when, when, when Gary and I first started reviewing the first iterations of the 3000 in-wall, Gary just was like, this isn't it. This isn't it. This is, we're, we're not going to put our name on this. And, yep. and really, that's what kicked off this big delay on bringing this product to market. And so the some of the biggest challenges for in-wall subwoofers is really rooted in cabinet volume. And that's rooted in where the th where the thing's getting installed. You know, an in-room subwoofer, you can make the cabinet as big as or as small as you need it to be. And, and you have those constraints of, of a footprint of a space. Um, for in-wall products like this, which is a sealed, it's a sealed enclosure, you have the stud bay, you have the the gap in the wall and that's it. And typical homes are built with two by four construction and 16 inch on, on center spacing between the studs. And that's a, that's a fairly small space. And so a subwoofer really wants cabinet volume. This was a, it's, it's starved of cabinet volume. And when I, one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about with this product is how we were able to overcome that challenge. And so what you can kind of see in the rendering is the whole front baffle of the, of the subwoofer and the whole rear baffle of the subwoofer are both made of formed sheet aluminum. So it's very strong, it's very rigid, it's very inert, and it's also you know two and, two and a half millimeters thick. So the, the MDF that's, in, that's used for the product is really just a picture frame that's got some internal bracing. And then the whole thing has, a, has kind of a bracing lattice structure that sandwiches the whole thing together. In the end, you get you capture all that cabinet volume that you might lose otherwise, and you make a, a really inert box um, that just delivers all the acoustic output into the room. So it was a it was a it was an exciting way to to address that challenge. So there's also uh, concerns with like the thermal performance, like overheating. Is that another thing you have to deal with? And what what sort of things do you have to do to uh, you know fix for that? <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of a lot of the category is kind of, I mean, I, I don't want to poo-poo anybody, but they're kind of underwhelming subwoofers. They're they're not really worried about delivering high current, high power to an in-wall sealed subwoofer that's enclosed in, in the wall. Here we are. So we're gonna capture every bit of the the 800 watts RMS power is coming out of the amplifier. And that's going to be a lot of power into two active drivers. So we're using all aluminum cones, all aluminum dust caps. We have this whole metal structure so that actually the thermals of the whole enclosure uh, are super efficient. And it, and it makes, you know, it allows us to capture all the power and maintain capturing the capture of all that power. And I would say the other biggest concern that I, I think, uh, you know, people would have is, you know, vibrational energy and, and how that can be transferred since it's actually a part of the wall. Um, you know, what sort of bracing, what sort of things do you need to do to make sure that doesn't become an issue? Yeah. And that, and that's where the, the aluminum and this kind of lattice structure that, that sandwiches the whole thing together makes it really inert. That's, that was like a, the other reason to do it. So now we've made this very rigid enclosure. And we, there's a there's a whole gasket system that goes on the back of the of the front baffle and on the rear of the cabinet, so that the that all of the acoustic energy is really transmitted into the room. Let me um, answer a couple of there's some questions here that we kind of got ahead of ourselves maybe a little bit. So, um, the in wall subwoofer is designed to fit in your wall. It can be installed in an existing room. Uh, there's a very clever uh, dog leg kind of screw design that Smith uh, uh, created so that um, you basically cut a hole in the in the drywall, you um, uh, insert the, the speaker in there, and then the dog leg screws adhere it to the studs. Um, it's really, really very simple. And if in new construction, we have what's called a rough end kit um, that your installer would use, um, and then it just installs on that. Um, the people are asking, where's the amplifier? The amplifier is separate. That's how you keep uh, 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 um, the, the subwoofer according to fire code. There's only the low voltage needed to drive a subwoofer. You run regular fire rated speaker wire, but it's just speaker wire from the amplifier. And it can be any length 
people are asking how far away. Well, sometimes people um, put the amplifier uh, at a what's called a head end, a, a, a central place in the home, um, and then run speaker wire to the subwoofer. Also, um, there's I, you can either get a one subwoofer or two subwoofer solution, both off of one amp. If you have your choice. People are also asking how much it is. It's $19.99 for the amplifier and subwoofer combination and $29.99 for the amplifier and two subwoofer combination. And I don't think anyone needs more than one, but we already have one customer that took four for one theater room. So I guess uh, anything's possible in the world of base loving people. So I think you touched on some of the applications here, but uh, maybe Ed, Larry, you guys can chime in on, on, you know, who would be a good fit for this, this type of product and, and what, you know, what expectations they should have with, uh, you know, in terms of installing it and those kind of things. Well, I can tell you, I've been playing with this thing quite a bit and showcasing it at different events and everything. I mean, think of, you know, you've, you've done that whole theater room that you're trying to make everything disappear. This is going to be fantastic for that. You can do, two, four, six, whatever you need for that particular room. And you can see by that last image Nick showed, it installs in the wall. And, and Nick, if you want, I have another image here that I don't know if you've got in that section that actually shows the subwoofer kind of on its side in front of the amp uh, that I can bring up. But the installation on it, part of the reason why we're uh, choosing to make sure this is done by installers is uh, we want to make sure that nobody messes up their walls or anything like that. So, um, the way this installs, there comes with a, a kit that your installer would follow up with and uh, put on the wall. It's got a template for how everything should be cut. And uh, let's see, there, I finally got it, I think. And um, the way it installs is there's dog ears that attach, and you can see those right here. There's these three dog ears on each side that come out and attach to the sheetrock. And if you really want an additional uh, security, you can actually mount it to your stud as well. But this is great for a theater, a music lover, a uh, two channel, you know, putting it in an office. You know, there's so many applications for it. Well, let me make a basic comment because Larry's exactly right. This is a sealed enclosure with dual active nine inch specially designed drivers. So do you have to stick it in your wall? Uh, no. In fact, I've had some in installation professionals tell me, hey, I'm just going to put it under the client's sofa and it's and it's absolutely appropriate you could totally do that because it is a self-contained sealed box dual active nine inch subwoofer um and it doesn't have to go in the wall it's just designed so that it can go in the wall point being um uh it's that's why it's perfect as an in-wall subwoofer it's a it's a completely self-contained sealed enclosure and creates the experience irrespective of where where it is. It's not going to rattle your walls because Smith designed an enclosure with front and rear baffles that are, pr practically speaking, inert. And I think it's uh, it's also important to sort of point out what has existed up until this point, and you know why why this product is the right you know right for SVS now because I think a lot of the in-wall subwoofer solutions you kind of said it, Gary, but they're not true subwoofers, and then the ones that maybe have Probably decent output. Probably not be too are, mean, but I mean, yeah, the like person getting an in-wall subwoofer, expensive. they're they're like they want to have an over-the-top experience, and they're paying this installer integrator to to create that, and then they get this thing that that doesn't sound as good as. Well, I won't name names, but as a as a low quality subwoofer, we we were not going to do this until we created something that was worthy of the SVS brand. And Smith is right. When I the first one of these that I got, I'm like, this is not getting SVS on it. It's just not. It's 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 fine for some brands. It's not fine for us. And and two years to get it where it is, but now it is an absolute monster. So uh, just to get a little more specific, this is a 3000 series subwoofer. So the the, the uh, yeah, amplifier the, the has point. the same rated power, which is 800 watts RMS, 2,500 watts of peak power. Um, and you mentioned the dual configuration, but I think that's kind of a cool feature um, that Smith, maybe you can uh, explain why we put that into this and made that available. Yeah, so the, it it's not an uncommon feature for for this category where you have a rack mount amplifier for an in-wall subwoofer and maybe it can drive one or two subwoofers. Um, there are different ways of approaching it. And so we, 
without getting into the weeds, we, we took an approach to it that would make sure that no matter if it was a single subwoofer system or a dual subwoofer system, you were always capturing all of the power out of the amplifier. So well, that's not actually the weeds. I think that's actually a great comment. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, because what you did, Smith, was you designed one subwoofer that was optimized to be a single solution right. connected to the amplifier. Then you designed a different subwoofer with a different crossover for the dual configuration. Di I don't different think impedance. Anybody... Yeah. Different, different impedance. Yeah, different impedance. Um, sorry. And and I, I don't think anybody would have taken the trouble of doing that. They would have just said, hey, you want to get two. Um, right, just instead, Smith said, no, I'm gonna op I'm gonna optimize it. So if there's two on that one amplifier, it um it's gonna fully deliver on the potential. Um, right. so I and it really I mean, I think one fully delivers on the potential. I've never actually heard two uh, in, in at the same time, so I'm 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 a little curious what that's even going to be like. It's a lot. And Ed, Ed for uh, you know, performance wise, I know you know you, you, we get asked all the time, even in the comments now, like, oh, can I mix a PB one thousand Pro with a PB three thousand? Those kind of things. You know, as far as maybe you have an existing subwoofer and you just want more even bass response throughout the room. What would you say about pairing an in wall with you know? other subwoofers if, if maybe somebody wants to go that route well it's a sealed our end wall is a sealed subwoofer so the natural candidate would be a sealed subwoofer in your room to pair it up with um, they're going to get along the most nicely from uh from a phase response standpoint uh, i mean you know anything can be done integrating subwoofers it's just more challenging to integrate a sealed and a ported sub so i would say sealed would be your best choice nick and I mean, I don't, do we want to get into the DIY side of it at all? Like, uh, you know, what sort of project that would entail? Um, you know, I know uh, this is a product that I, most people will have installed by a professional, but, you know, we have some pretty handy uh, members of our community there. So, you know, you, you have to take into account. Here, if, if, if you know how to install, say, uh, uh, a light can in your ceiling, or you know how to install um, uh, 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 a a uh maybe you've done speakers or something if you yeah. know how to do stuff like that you probably could do it we just we didn't want to give somebody competency test before we sold it to them so for us it just felt like a better solution would be let's just not offer it direct although we did authorize crutchfield to sell it direct so if you absolutely want to buy it direct i crutchfield will do it and they'll give you the support you need um it, it's it's not a particularly exotic thing to install but you do need to know what you're doing and yeah, fishing, say, fishing wires is is difficult too uh if you haven't done it before and right. you need to make sure your wiring as gary mentioned earlier is you know fire rated cl fire rated wiring if the wire is going in your wall it needs to be yeah, fire rated it sure does uh so fishing wire from the amplifier through the wall if you're passing through studs or going over the ceiling it's it's uh, a challenge and it's something professional <clears throat> installers do all the time but it's not something your typical homeowner would be able to tackle so we're, we're up for a giveaway. I, I'm, a, I'm really good at hooking things up i'm not trying to pat myself on the back <laughs> you do not want me trying to install this thing in my wall and fishing wires it would be a disaster <laughs> so and i've been doing this a long time but there is, there are options for uh, existing rooms, you know, where you can basically, what they say, retrofit it in, or there's a uh, pre-construction bracket if you actually have, you know, your walls at the stud level and you're you're putting it in. So um, we have multiple options depending on where you are in, in terms of the project that uh, it's a part of. Um, well, any other closing thoughts? Any anecdotes? Anything else you guys want to share? We we good talking about three thousand new wall because we got lightning round. I know we got questions piling up. This is a special product. If you look at the category uh, of the in-wall subwoofers, it's dominated by extremely expensive, over-the-top, very, very uh, difficult to install because you're cutting out huge pieces of sheetrock, and it takes your installers a lot of time. And every bit of feedback I've heard from the install staff that I've worked with that have installed this thing have just been enamored with how simple it was and uh, how amazing Great it, it performed. Sounds. And yeah, then on top of that, I mean, I'm sound. getting the, some jaded yeah. people texting me and emailing me saying, holy cow. And they didn't say cow, but I'm, this is yeah. a family show. Uh, I cannot believe the, what this subwoofer is doing. Uh, it's really changed a lot of people's minds about what's possible in the in-wall subwoofer space. So well done, Smith and team. 
So there are some questions in the comments that I think are worth addressing. Is it sealed or ported? I think we covered that. It is a sealed cabinet uh, cool. version. Act the important answer to that question is not just that it's sealed. It is sealed. It's a self-contained enclosure, um, but both drivers are active. A lot of times when you see two drivers in an in-wall solution, one of them is a passive radiator. That's the cheap way to do it. Basically a driver that's not hooked up and just moving uh, in conjunction with the, with the actively driven driver. These are both active drivers. Also, I saw, I did see a couple comments. I wish it were ported. The problem with porting it is then you're going to start shaking your walls. You need that inert um, and also there's other reasons, you know, why you wouldn't want to port it, but, but one of the big reasons is it's, it's going to create a, uh, an experience that not just you will enjoy, but everyone anywhere near that subwoofer, whether they're in the room or not. And that's not necessarily what you want. Well, let me hit a few more of these questions. Um, after I do this giveaway of our prime wireless pro powered speakers and the winner of that's a good a one. Pair I want to win prime that. Wireless pro is, uh, Zachariah Fraley, Zachariah Fraley, enjoy Congrats. your new powered bookshelf speakers. Yay, yes, Zachariah. Pro, coming your way. Couple quick hitter questions about the uh, in-wall sub. One, yes, the grill is paintable, so you don't have to have it in white. You can have it blend with whatever color your walls are and it just adds to that uh, lifestyle factor there. Um, can it be, does it have the Bluetooth control app? I'm surprised we left that one out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like all SVS subwoofers now and in the future, it will have the Bluetooth control app. It does um, have it. Yep. We mentioned the uh, nine inch dual active drivers. That is the size. They are dual nine inch. If you want to get deeper specs, we do have a product page, which will give you the frequency response and all of those things as well. Um, and then uh, there was a question about a back box. And we, there's not a back box that you install because it's a sealed cabinet enclosure. Let, uh, let, me, let me answer that one. Kit, but yeah, give a, a little insight uh, there. When, when a person is asking about a back box, that person is asking, can you make it into a sealed enclosure by buying a back box? That's for speakers that are just um, drivers um, attached to a, a, a a baffle with no cabinet. And that's a typical way that in lower priced in wall speakers are oriented. Um, this is a completely self contained sealed cabinet. So you don't need a back box. It's a sealed cabinet. It's a very uncompromised solution. And so that answers uh, another question of, do you have to modify or add any framing to install the in-wall sub? And the answer is you don't have to, um, you know, it's you don't all have to, nor do you, you, I wouldn't do it. There's no reason to do it. Yeah. And it's, it's also it's able right to there, ready to go in your wall and it will create magic for you. Yeah. And you can turn it the, the way it's oriented. Some of you may be bringing wire from underneath, whether from a basement or a first floor upward or downward. So it's designed to go in the wall either way. Yep. And in the box is included some banana plugs for your installer to attach to the wire, then simply connect to the subwoofer so that it's wired. Someone mentioned <clears throat> earlier that they have a, a, a older home with non-standard stud spacing, and, and that might be one of the corner cases where you would want to box out a frame to mount the subwoofer to. But it's a, it's a perfect reason to hire a professional to install it when you've got non-standard stud spacing and you need to do some some uh, some construction and modifications to make sure it mounts properly. Yep, to go a little further on placement, you know, if you are choosing this, uh, any tips in terms of where in a room you're gonna get the best performance in terms of uh, where you'd wanna install the 3000 in wall? Corner loading maybe? So, Somebody well, take me the there, was a lot of, there were a lot of questions about how to do the subwoofer call with this. And this is probably the easiest product in our lineup to do it with because it's conventional speaker wire coming off of the amplifier. So you could put it near your listening position and kind of walk around and find the point in your room where it makes the most sense to go. Or as Nick was saying, you know, corner loading uh, just a few inches off the wall. Off I mean, in side. general, well, you want you know, it closer to the floor I mean, I though, right? For the most just to be to be to be lifestyle sensitive, the reason people get this product typically is that they don't want to see it and they don't want anything to do with the visual interaction with it. And so, you know, Smith designed a subwoofer that is very room friendly, and I wouldn't obsess too much over uh, placement. I would place it where it suits your lifestyle because this is a a, a subwoofer that performs incredibly well uh, for its class. But I mean. 
not to rain on any parades and maybe I'm going to sound, I probably shouldn't even say this, but I mean, look at, at less than half the price an SB 2000 pro would be a good choice for you. If you don't mind having an outboard subwoofer, I, I, you know, and that, that's the, the, the reason you get this is because you want an in-wall subwoofer. Um, the reason you get an SVS in-wall subwoofer is because you want it to actually be a subwoofer and not be sort of a, a, a what I would call not unchar very uncharitably. I would call it an, an, a lot of the uh, every other one I've ever seen an imposter, not really a subwoofer. Well, I think on that note, uh, if there's nothing else, we're, we're happy to answer questions, you know, in future episodes as well. Um, but, you know, I, I think we gave a, a good background on why this product came to market and, you know, what were uh, what our expectations. I mean, it's just uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we're not going to have it at Expona. So I heard I saw somebody ask that, uh, but we will have it at some of our upcoming shows. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, somebody asked if I'm going to put it in my home theater. Oh, no, I got my dual SB 4000s here. Uh, they're doing just fine uh, the way they are. So no need to add an in wall. Um, so let's get to our lightning round here. And we have some uh, some great questions from uh, previous as well as uh, what we have in the comments here. Um, and I am going to start this one out with, uh, Ed, you're probably good to answer this one, but I think Gary would have some insights too. Uh, Kevin asks, is it bad to have an amp that sends out more watts than your speaker's maximum recommended uh, amount in, in terms of what they can handle? Uh, no, it's not bad at all, actually. Uh, more uh, Contrary to popular belief, more power is actually safer for a loudspeaker because um, it, at, at your normal listening level, the amplifier is less likely to, to clip, um, which is, which is lopping off the transients, which is very difficult. Well, can I, let me, let me, um, cause I don't know if everybody understands what clipping is. Um, so let me, can I draw a picture for people? Uh, um, and it explains why a, sure. a low powered amplifier blows up speakers. Um, so I totally agree with Ed more power is not the problem. Um, less, not enough power is what blows speakers. Right. If you think of a sound wave as being this rounded off thing going up and down, an amplifier that can't deliver on what you're asking for squares off the sound wave instead of letting it go uh, its normal uh, shape. And the squared off sound wave is like jarring to the tweeter. And so a low, lower powered amplifier blows up tweeters. I will say that if you have too much power and you run it for too long you can blow up mid ranges because they're moving playing louder than they really were designed to even though it's undistorted it usually will not happen unless you're doing it for hour after hour after hour at super loud volumes and we try at, uh, at svs to create speakers that just can tolerate pretty much any amount of abuse as long as it's not distorted so I wouldn't worry at all about having too much power. Too little power is the the, the thing to be a wor fearful of. Yep. So Smith, I'm really going to challenge you here uh, to give a uh, layman's definition of uh, what is the Q factor? Stop right there because the he's going to fail. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I'm trying to bait him into it. What is the Q factor on the SVS Subble for Control app? What is what is that control? What is that uh, manage there? The the Q is basically like the how peaky. It's kind of the width of of a filter so if you if you have if you want something that's a really high q so a q of 10 it's like a it's a very narrow spike of a filter frequency and the range that it covers if you want a really broad filter then you go to a, a much you're talking about number. just you got to say what you're talking about yeah talking i was going to ask you're talking about the parametric equalizer yes mm -hmm. So when you're and doing actually actually the, there's a bet there's a better way for me to explain it go, go ahead. download our app you don't need to have our, our subwoofer. I'm serious. You go download our app, go to the, the PEQs, and then what the shape of the filter and, and where and what you're uh, manipulating on that filter. That's basically this is what, what you get range of frequencies Smith are getting. Layman's terms. I, I, it's, such a, it's just a visual element. It makes well, it there's, so there's a tutorial. Which let, let me, can I, can I give a little bit of a... This, uh, let me just translate this into English for a second. Um, <laughs> First of all, we're talking about the Q of uh, the, the slope of our parametric equalizer. The beauty of a parametric equalizer is it allows you to shape the actual frequencies you want to affect. Instead of a, a big fat mess of frequencies that you're raising up and down, you can actually focus it to a very specific range 
that you're trying to address. And um, the narrower the Q, and I don't know, this is where you can help me, Smith. The number- a High, high from, Q means it's narrow, yeah. Yeah, and a, so the and a higher low Q the Q, means Q the narrower the, the frequency range that you're addressing. And so if you say to yourself, I really only wanna touch this very narrow band of frequencies, you can do that by raising the Q. Is that, see, that's how you say it in English. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. I feel so like you just that, said what I said. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, I mean, the app is a great visual tool. <laughs> As you noodle around with the Q value, you can mm -hmm. see the filter expanding and contracting. Right. Um, so it's, it's very intuitive when you're looking at it visually. Uh, all right, giveaway yeah, time. Right. You can see, you. Uh, that's right. I mean, you can see it on the graph. How, um, so you can have fun you with that. You can see it. I once caught a fish this big. He's right. <laughs> I'll bring a dry erase board next time. <laughs> Please do. That would be great. We need some more visual aids. We've done really well with the visual aids today. So I think more of that's great. Uh, but you know what else is great? Giving away a 3000 micro subwoofer. And you know who's going to be happy about that? Jay Anderson. Jay Anderson. Yeah. Congrats, hey. man. You got a 3,000 Congratulations, micro. Jay. Can I tell a funny story about that sub real quick? Oh, geez. Yeah. Last week, I was in Louisiana doing some training with some of our retailers, and I had a group of installers, and we were talking about the 3,000 micro, and uh, we told them how, how it was inert, and you can go put your hand on it and touch it and stuff. And that's always weird to say uh, about a, a piece of electronics, but uh, I see this group of dudes just start laughing, and I was trying to figure out what it was. And one of the guys had sat a nickel on top of the, the 3000 micro on its just, edge. On, yeah. On its edge, standing upright as I'm doing this training, we're just cranking tunes and have all this stuff going and they're all laughing. And I'm like, what did I miss? Cause I was talking and they all start pointing and there's this nickel just sitting right on top of the sub unmoved. And it, it kind of blew them away. And this was seven or eight minutes of just cranking that thing. So uh, it's kind of the same thought process that Gary and Smith were getting to earlier with the end wall. It's that same kind of inertness. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's that inertness of the cabinet, which creates um, uh, an experience where, you know, th there's no ability for the room to sort of ruin that experience. By the way, every time Nick's camera goes off, he's doing a shot of Irish whiskey. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel, like I've, I feel like I've gotten more sober as this is going on. So as you know, I'm not tripping on my words quite as bad. You uh, had nowhere to go but up. I know, seriously. Um, all right, a couple more in-wall subwoofer questions. Uh, Frederick wants to know, can you put it in your ceiling, and would you want to have a, an in-wall subwoofer in your ceiling? You could totally put it anywhere you want. Um, you would want to make sure that it, whatever you do supports the weight of the product. But as far as where it is, that it can go anywhere you want. It could, it could be floating in the middle of the room if you wanted to because it's, it's a self-contained experience. Hmm. And yep. can you use the wireless audio adapter with it? You can. It's even got so, the USB port on there to power it. So but I don't see why you would do yeah. that, though, because you would just put the amplifier wherever the source right, is, and you would wire it. The, 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 and you have to run a wire to the this obviously to the subwoofer that's in the wall to the module that's in the wall. So you could, in theory, do that, but I don't really see a reason why you would want to. It doesn't make sense. It's a rack mounted amp, so it would be near your AV processor typically. So uh, Dan C asks, how do I get assistance with putting a system together? I have a Rotel 1576 MK2 and a Meridian G55 in a 500 square foot room. Ed, what would you tell Don or Dan about uh, putting a system together? Reach out to us in customer service and we can even do a video consultation. If you want to show us the room layout, we can recommend speaker placement, subwoofer placement, uh, system setup, all optimizing all your settings. Uh, that's what we specialize in. So reach out to us and we'll, we'll set up a consultation with you. Travis B wants to know, will the SoundBase Pro be enough to power the Ultra Towers? And if he adds a 3000 micro, is he really going to see a benefit there? Larry, maybe you take that one. Sound-based pro and ultra towers. What do you think? It will absolutely. And I see Smith kind of nodding and smiling with that. It totally will. It, it, that it is another a pretty banging system right there. Yeah. That, that thing is killer. And whether you put a That was also one of our tests to ourselves, right, Smith? I mean, we mm -hmm. said, I said to Smith, this, well, I don't want to make it sound like be about me. We, we agreed <laughs> that, that, that the sound base pro was going to drive, be able to drive any SVS speaker for sure. And what we created basically was uh, a, a streaming integrated amplifier that can pretty much drive any speakers on the planet. 
It's a very robust amplifier module that's yeah. in there. Yeah, and with, with that much power, the Ultra Towers would really slam, but adding any subwoofer, you know, obviously you'd get uh, a different experience. So, Ed, maybe this one's for you. Uh, benefits or drawbacks of a Y splitter versus Daisy chaining your subwoofers? And this is basically when you want to have more than one subwoofers. You only question. have one subwoofer output. Um, it allows you to have multiple subwoofers when there's only one coming out of the source. So, Ed, what, what are the benefits, drawbacks of each? I, I'd say if your both subs are on the front wall, a Y splitter. Isla. This is Isla. Hi, Isla. Can you wave? Hi. Hi, Isla. <laughs> you, you, you were saying? You for, I don't know if she's done the happy soup? hour. <laughs> Isla, no green beer for you. <laughs> no green beer for you. Uh, so if you have one sub out and you need to connect to two subwoofers, a Y splitter makes sense if they are on the same wall. Uh, if you are connecting to the first subwoofer and then maybe jumping over to another subwoofer in the back of the room, daisy chaining might make sense where this cable goes to the first sub and then the output from the first sub jumpers over to the second sub. So uh, it really is more application dependent. Uh, rather than any advantage sonically. I'm sure Smith would agree it's it's essentially the same thing electrically, whether mm -hmm. you split the signal at the AV processor or daisy chain, both subs end up with the same signal. Yep. And you're, so I've, I've actually wondered that myself. I've not done an AV test. You're saying there's not going to be any audible sort of delay by daisy chaining because no. presumably the Y, okay, All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, so I actually learned something. Because I usually will not make a claim about something unless I've personally experienced it. And I personally have not really, you know, tried the two different ways to, to just make a comparison. Another I, bet, I bet you have, Ed. I bet you have. <laughs> yep. That's <laughs> the same. <laughs> So uh, with the in-wall subwoofer, any special power requirements as far as, you know, 20 amp circuit, more, you know, anything that people have to be concerned with there? Standard Nothing to be concerned data. about. No. And in fact, here's a question. I mean, you know, here, here's a, a, you know, if I can use it as a, as a you know, a, a, a booth of SVS, you know, we take into account voltage fluctuations with every one of our uh, products that plug into a wall um, in the sense that, that um, they're, they, they go all over the world. They're in places where, um, voltages are not as reliable as they are in the U.S. But even uh, as you go everywhere around the U.S., it, there are different experiences in different places, even within the U.S. And so we have worked hard to make sure that that's just not a thing to worry about um, with an SVS subwoofer or with Prime Wireless uh, Pro products. It's nothing you have to worry about. Yeah, and that next week I'm going to be in Orlando doing a massive event with one of our retail partners, and uh, there's all these deal, all these other brands that are setting up stuff and having to request extra power and all these 20 amp and extra 20 amp drops in their rooms, and it's hundreds of dollars to do. I'm like, nah, I'm uh, I'm good. We're gonna hook up all this stuff off of whatever uh, outlets are there in the room. So and it's a it's a can't work in a, if it can't work in a normal person's home, then why are they presenting it to the yeah. retailer? It's kind of hard to imagine. It's a class D amplifier, which is very efficient. It, it runs very cool. It only pulls the power from the AC outlet that it needs in order to hit the requirements of the subwoofer. Um, and it, you're not going to need a 20 amp circuit or anything like that. Um, just connect it to the same 15 amp circuit that the rest of your system's on. Here's a question I can answer, which I love. Uh, John H. asks, he has a, a 2.1 system. How high should he have his uh, bookshelf speakers? And the answer I like to give is when you're seated, the tweeter should be roughly at ear level. And I think that's the best sort of frame of reference. If you have the option to adjust the height and, you know, whether you're using stands or piece of furniture, tweeters at ear level. Any other uh, advice as far as Nick. placement of bookshelves in a 2.1? In front of lateral triangle? Yeah. Oh, I always, you know, I, I would say that that's that's pretty much guaranteed what you said, Nick, guaranteed that that's going to be the right call. The other things to think about are sometimes what I would I would say iterative, like try different things. Um, I, I like to, um, 
you know, anywhere between four and 10 feet apart, it, it, depending on the room. So you want to play with that. The other thing is if it's a pretty focused listening position, meaning one or two people, try towing it in a little bit, which means aiming it a little bit inward towards the listening position. A lot of times that will focus the sound stage and make it seem more um, exact. And that when you have a very exact focused sound stage, um, that's more convincing. Uh, right now I have Prime Wireless Pro on my desk and they're maybe five feet apart. And the imaging on them is fantastic. Mean, so I'm listening to you all right now and the imaging is perfect. It's right here from directly in front of me. Uh, if I back up a bit, the imaging is fantastic too. So Larry, uh, same, same here. Mine are yeah. got to be five feet apart. They're towed in. I'm looking at mine too and they're towed <laughs> in right to me. So, Smith, are yours on either side of your desk too? No, I literally have everything against this wall because it's convenient. <laughs> but in my but in my two channel room, I have a two channel room. I've basically positioned my pinnacles kind of like as far into the room so I can get that kind of 3D depth localization and the, with a slight toe in. And then I'm basically sacrificing some of the low frequency boundary loading because I have an SB16 to go with it to to cover the bottom end. Nice. So yeah. But that, that took a lot of like playing and, and minutia and, and, and tweaking. And, you know, I love that. Part. You know, Nick, before we sign off, uh, you know, I, I maybe that's something I don't even want to say, but I, I feel like saying it because I was so happy to see this this morning. Um, you know, SVS has been making speakers uh, just a little bit more than 10 years. So it really hasn't been that long. Um, and um, Digital Trends just... Uh, did an article, the top speaker brands in the world um, at this moment in time. And um, they had seven brands. And SBS was one of the seven brands, which I was so proud of that because it we did it so quickly. The other six brands have all been doing it a gajillion years. And we're right there. You know, I, I could make the case that we're, you know, right there with these top other six brands, and we did it uh, in 10 years, thanks to Smith, among other people that we all work together with. Um, and I can't wait to see what the next 10 years hold. But what, a, what an incredible um, validation of what you guys have accomplished, Smith, that we're now in the top seven speaker brands, according to Digital, digital Trends, which is a total, we have no relationship with them. They're a totally neutral tech website. So it's just kind of a cool moment for me. Smith, I can't tell if you're blushing or if that's the, uh, the scotch. He was, but proud. Yes. Way, he was you, proud. It could you be both. It, you earned it. And, you know, I think we, <laughs> we've got a phenomenal subwoofer for pedigree. We talked a lot about it with the in wall. We're still breaking new ground as far as that goes. But I, I agree, Gary. It was just such like a, a positive to see that um, announcement. Oh, it looks like I'm getting bombed now, too, with the, uh, the kid visit. Hello. This is Axel. Say hi, Axel. <laughs> hi. <laughs> All right. Hi, well, Axel. we got a giveaway to do. Uh, Actually, but I will need to say, meet Isla. Yeah, we get to meet Isla and the kids, and even my wife's here too. Oh, I don't want to lose lose the feed. I've been having issues. Um, so uh, yeah, next broadcast will be take your dad on... green beer into the other room, please. <laughs> I'll drink it. Um, April thirteenth uh, at uh, Expona, we'll be live in Chicago doing our thing. We'll have some special guests, some people dropping in. Uh, probably not family members, but maybe some press and uh, some people who are involved with organizing the show. So we're super excited about Expona on April 13th. Please tune in at that time. Final giveaway of the evening. I'm going to see if I can get all this out without tripping on my words. A Prime Wireless Pro sound base with a pair of Prime bookshelf speakers and our SoundPath Ultra Speaker cables. A phenomenal 2.0 stereo package, and the winner of that is one, Mr. Jason Curtis. Jason Curtis, congratulations. 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 Coming your way. Congrats. And uh, thank you all, everybody, for tuning in today. We'll be back on April 13th. Appreciate all the comments and love, as always. I'm happy listening for the future. Oh, there's my wife. Hey, <laughs> there's Alex. Oh, wait, my kid. <laughs> what is really this is family night. night. <laughs> Lean in. <laughs> this is Lucas. That's all right. Name. There it is. All right. Signing off. Thanks all. Right. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. They don't want it to end.